Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, history is made as Mississippi elects its first woman as Agriculture Commissioner. Isaiah diseases and preventing Formosan termites from invading your home were on the agenda at Poplarville. Employees of the MSU Extension Service are honored for their work in Starkville. In Southern Gardening, how to have your garden change with the seasons and still be beautiful. In the markets, the latest crop report cuts the nation's corn harvest as Japan says it plans to relax its restrictions on imports of U.S. beef. In the feature segment, food deserts. Some say they don't exist, but most people have to travel further and further to get a full service grocery store. Food deserts can occur in rural as well as urban settings. We haven't had a grocery store for 13 years or something even more than that. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spain. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Tuesday's election in Mississippi will see a wholesale change in the state's elected agriculture leadership. Leighton, there will be new faces in every seat from the agriculture commissioner to both chairmanships of the Mississippi House and Senate agriculture committees. All the faces could turn out to be Republicans. In the commissioner of agriculture and commerce race, Republican Cindy Hyde-Smith of Brookhaven defeated Democrat Joel Gill of Pickens and Reform Party nominee Kathy Tool of Bluxy. Hyde-Smith is the first woman elected com agriculture commissioner in Mississippi. With the election of Lynn Finch to state treasurer, it will be the first time that two women will serve in statewide offices at the same time. Hyde-Smith's family operates a cattle sale barn. The former Democrat uh, turned Republican Hyde Smith has served 12 years in the Mississippi Senate. She also served as the chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee. Since the Republicans have a majority in the Mississippi Senate, the next Ag Committee chairman will be a Republican. There will also be a new Agriculture Committee chairman in the Mississippi House. House Ag Committee chairman and Democrat Greg Ward of Ripley did not stand for re-election. If the Republican Party gains control of the Mississippi House, the Ag Committee chairmanship would go to the GOP as well. Initiative 31 on strengthening eminent domain protections passed easily. The initiative drive was led by the Mississippi Farm Bureau, but it seemed to resonate with landowners of all stripes. One highlight of last week's Extension Service Annual Conference at Mississippi State was the presentation of the Outstanding Worker Awards for 2011. Given the Outstanding Extension Faculty Award by Extension Director Gary Jackson was Dr. David Ingram. Ingram is a research professor at the Central Mississippi Research and Extension Center in Raymond. He is recognized as an expert on diseases in greenhouse tomatoes. And given the Outstanding Extension Non-Faculty Award was Leslie Berger. Berger's award was presented by Gary Blair of Southern Ag Credit. Berger is a wildlife biologist in the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Aquaculture. Her specialty area is conservation education and she has taught over 10,000 individuals. Also at the banquet, a 50-year service award was presented to Nancy Bearden by Extension Director Jackson. Bearden has the distinction of being the university's longest tenured employee. She joined the Extension office in Louisville as a county secretary in August 1960 and has no plans of retiring soon. The recent Ornamental Horticulture Field Day at Poplarville covered a wide variety of topics. You might expect to learn about controlling azalea web blight, Homeowners, however, learned how to identify and prevent Formosa and termite infestations. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports from the South Mississippi Branch Experiment Station of Mississippi State University. At this year's Ornamental Horticulture Field Day, visitors learned about not only caring for gardens, but also protecting their homes from termites. K.C. Lee, research associate at the Mississippi State University South Branch Experiment Station, discusses what attracts the Formosan termite and where they are found. The Formosan termites swarm at nighttime and they tend to be attracted to any kind of light source, which is like a porch light or solar lights in a garden and debris filled gutters, downspouts that may be funneling moisture into the 
home. Additionally, leaky plumbing provides a source of moisture where termites can feed. Lee says finding mud tubes around your home is a sign of infestation. A mud tube is the tubes that the termites create to hold the moisture and it looks just it's just a little tube of mud about the size of a pencil. We see them behind the shower walls because that goes back to the leaky plumbing. You'll see them in your attics. You'll see them outside the, on the perimeter of your home going up the foundation. Lee says to contact a reputable pest control operator at the first sign of infestation. USDA plant pathologist Warren Copes explains what research concludes about scheduling azalea web blight fungicide application. Calendar date is the base, which is the simplest criteria for scheduling fungicides, and then a scouting technique of looking into the plant and counting the number of dead leaves allows for us to adjust for the year-to-year -year variability in case you need to spray earlier than normal or a normal year or later. Maximum daily temperatures above 93 degrees Fahrenheit suppress disease development. And this year, those types of conditions became common in early June versus July. Copes says those conditions result in the need to wait later to schedule a fungicide application for azalea web blight. The Ornamental Horticulture Field Day was held at the Mississippi State University South Branch Experiment Station. From Poplarville, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. The November crop production report was released Wednesday by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. For the most part, the market had factored in most of the report before the numbers release. Late and span, we'll have more later. As we look at soybeans, in the U.S., crop down slightly from the October estimate at uh, just over 3 billion bushels. As we look at Mississippi soybeans, a 73 million bushel crop being predicted. That's down from last year, but the yield is forecast at 41 bushels per acre statewide, and that would be a record and is up from last year. Looking at U.S. corn, uh, the crop has been shrinking, 12.3 billion bushels. That's down a percent from last year in terms of Mississippi acreage. Uh, also shrunk some this year, uh, down 260,000 bushels as far as the total crop. Yield set at 118 bushels per acre, and that's off 18 from last year, but the same as in October. U.S. cotton, 16.3 million bales being predicted. That's down 10 percent from last year. Here in Mississippi, we're seeing ours increase due to more acres and uh, better yields. 1.2 million bales being reported here. That is up 258,000 from last year. Yield stands at 952 pounds per acre. U.S. rice, 188.1 million hundredweight, and that is off from last year. Here in Mississippi, uh, way off 10.9 million hundredweight, and that's down 9.4 million hundredweight from last year. A lot less rice planted in Mississippi. Yield 7,100 pounds per acre, and that is up 250 from last year. U.S. peanuts, 3.65 billion pounds being predicted. That is down 508 from last year. Prices uh, up for peanut butter here in Mississippi. We see great yields, 3,900 pounds per acre. That's up 400 from last year and the highest in the nation. But uh, in terms of our overall uh, crop, though, it is down 58.5 million pounds. Well, you think that the landscape has little to offer as we head into winter. Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us how to create cool season garden interest. Today I'm at the home of Nina and Charles Rivenberg. Their backyard is an attractive example of the landscape transitioning into winter. All throughout the garden, there are sculptures that help to add interesting character. This large ceramic frog is sitting in a pond of liriope with the red and green oxalis in the foreground. The yellow and black pansies add winter color. Though the weather is getting cooler, the garden still has a tropical feel. Elephant ear and green autumn fern have a warm feeling. The gold dust of Cuba and the large leaves of deeply lobed Japanese fancia seem to be making this rooster crow. There are splashes of color available, like this planting of late season Betty Boop Floribunda Rose. And this garden angel watches over the back trail of late season hosta, ajuga, coral begonia, and mondo grass. Leslie Ann's Sasanqua camellia provides good fall and winter color. The pink double flowers shine against an evergreen background. 
There are lots of textural contrasts. The dried flowers of Mississippi Medallion Winter, Limelight Hydrangea, and the foliage and red berries of Nandina add interest. This purple leaf Loripetalum adds color in the cool season. The feathery dark pink flowers are a welcome sight. Remember, the cool season doesn't mean no color or interest in your landscape. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says to look at other gardens this time of year, see what you like, and then add it to your cool season landscape. Well, Leighton, in the feature segment, food deserts. Some people say they don't exist, but they do, and they can happen in urban and rural settings. Time now for the markets with Leighton Span, and now the top story is the USDA's production and supply demand numbers. That's right. As you noted a bit earlier, those new projections came out Wednesday. We do have analysis in a moment. Also ahead, South America planting progress impacts soybean prices. The weak economy does not seem to be deterring organic food sales. And a large U.S. discount outlet wants to buy choice grade beef for its stores. Lower U.S. corn yields were one headline out of the November 9th production and supply demand reports from USDA. In an interview Wednesday afternoon with me over the internet, broker Nolan Cullen with Walsh Trading of Jackson discussed the report's likely impact on the corn, soybean, and cotton markets. Nolan, did we see a lot of changes in the corn sector from those October reports a month ago? Uh, no, Layton. Uh, today, USDA pretty well came in with what the trade was expecting, uh, particularly in the corn. We did see the corn production lowered by approximately a bushel and a half. Uh, that was a bullish indication for corn. However, the USDA offset that corn reduction uh, by changing feed seed residual, lowering it 100 million. So, on balance, the, for, the trade uh, versus expectations of a carryover potentially around 800 million. Uh, USDA only lowered that carryover to 843. Uh, that was somewhat of a disappointment. Uh, on the day, the market traded both sides. We're still optimistic for corn prices going higher into the first of the year. Uh, keep an eye on the relationship between the existing corn crop in December 12, March 12, uh, versus the December 12. That spread is still firming, indicating there's a basic demand under the market for a current supply of corn. All right, let's talk about soybeans a moment. What kind of numbers do we have for the bean market? Uh, no real surprises for the soybeans. Uh, the government uh, did lower yields, but again, offset that reduction in the crop by lowering exports some 50 million. This raised the projected carryover for next year in soybeans to 195 million. Uh, that's versus last expectations of 160. Uh, basically, the beans appear to be struggling here. We're seeing larger Brazilian production, southern hemisphere production. Uh, so we think beans are in a critical situation. We've had uh, several days of a close below $12 in the spot market. Uh, we think that's a bearish sign. So we're a little bit concerned that beans could see lower prices into year end and early into next year. And a lot of speculation about cotton before these new reports. Were there changes for cotton? Uh, virtually no changes for the cotton market on USDA's report. Some traders call the report boring. Uh, I would caution that uh, we're trying to build a base in the cotton roughly between 95 and a dollar. Uh, we've had several rallies in the last couple of months. However, I would be leery that if cotton, spot cotton, either the March or the December closes below 95, it may open the door for lower prices on the cotton market into the first of the year. Nolan Cullen mentioned larger Brazilian production as being a factor in the soybean market. Analyst Elaine Cub of Agricultural Risk Consulting goes so far as to say South America is the fundamental reason why the soybean chart has stayed fairly bearish. Technical traders were looking for that soybean chart to come up again over its 30-day moving average this week, which it never was able to do. It never closed above 1240, for instance, on the November chart. And the only real fundamental reason behind that would be the excellent planting progress in South America. And I know that that should affect those deferred contracts more than the nearby one, but it seems to be a story that's, that's affecting that soybean market as a whole. According to a study by the Organic Trade Association, 78% of U.S. families are choosing to buy organic. The report also says that 4 in 10 respondents indicate they are buying more organic products now than they were a year ago. The survey also finds that just under half of parents said they primarily buy organic because they believe organic products are healthier for themselves and their children. 
Again, this information comes from a study published by the organic food industry. We have a seasonal question for our trivia this week. Eggnog is, of course, a popular holiday dairy product. Our short question is, where did eggnog originate? Is the answer America or England? You'll find out here a bit later on Farm Week. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar in the second part of the markets. Leighton Span reports Japan is relaxing its rules on beef imports from the United States. In the feature segment today, food deserts. It's possible to live in an area where nutritious food is unavailable. Each year, many Mississippians are seriously injured or killed in farm tractor accidents. Transporting and lifting objects with a front loader requires extreme caution. Unsecured objects can roll or slide down the loader arms and injure the driver. To help prevent injuries, tractors should be equipped with a falling objects protection system. Always secure loads or use a bale spear or straps before lifting objects. A message from the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi State University's annual row crop short course takes place December 5th through the 7th on campus in Starkville. Register by November 25th and it's free. At the door is $40. If you want some ideas that will save or make you money, this is the place to be. The agenda includes Kip Colors of Missouri, the holder of the soybean yield world record. We'll also have uh, the registration and information uh, links on our Farm Week calendar. A biomass and bioenergy short course is Thursday, December 8th. The location is the Granada County Office of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. It's for landowners, businesses, or local governments interested in learning about the basics and the economics of woody biomass energy. Registration is $35 per person or $50 per couple. You need to register by December 1st. We'll also have a link on the calendar to help you. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. We focus on livestock in this next segment. The Japanese government says it plans to slightly relax its current restrictions on imports of U.S. beef, according to news reports. Analyst Naomi Bloom of Tells Market to Market, this development helps keep the fed cattle sector what she calls a friendly marketplace. And with the news this week that Japan is going to be relaxing their rules and regulations, um, we're going to see that market continue to grow. So Japan went from saying um, only 20 month, 20 month and younger beef coming in to 30 months and under. Mm -hmm. That's a huge deal. And so that's actually already factored to increase the market by 25% for exports. And in addition to that, you said it quite well that the cow slaughter numbers and the heifer slaughter numbers, we're not seeing any changes in those. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, I think there's no herd rebuilding. And it's going to continue to be that way until the market sees what the rainfall is and how the pastures are going to be, along with other feed prices. But right now, it's a really friendly picture. Walmart's recent announcement that it will begin carrying choice gray beef in all of its U.S. stores will change some key dynamics in the beef sector. This according to the CAE CME Group's Daily Livestock Report. The CME says the dynamics involved range from feeding practices all the way back through the seed stock sector. The report notes that the choice select spread has widened substantially as talk of Walmart's change for all its 3,800 U.S. stores has filtered through the beef industry. Well, time to change from livestock back to trivia to wind up the markets. And our answer this week is B, England. That's where the dairy beverage we know as eggnog first originated. In this week's feature segment, Food Deserts. Some dismiss the idea outright, but the location and number of grocery stores are changing. Food sales continue to gravitate to larger, fewer chain stores as neighborhood operations go out of business. This forces people to travel further to buy food. Those who can't afford the transportation are caught in a bind. Market to Market's Laura Bauer Bergmeier reports. It's something a lot of Americans take for granted. Healthy and nutritious food easily accessible at a nearby grocery store. But in urban and rural parts of the United States, many Americans live in what's been coined a food desert. 
Simply put, a food desert is a low-income census tract where a substantial number of residents lack easy access to a grocery store. First Lady Michelle Obama estimates that 23.5 million Americans live in a food desert. And you can find these deserts in both urban and rural areas, though they differ. Consider North Omaha. Parts of this community in Nebraska's largest city have some of the highest levels of poverty in the U.S., particularly among African Americans. Nebraska State Senator Brenda Council's district is in North Omaha. Many urban communities, the retail industry will look at the number of rooftops and uh, what the median income is, and uh, those will be uh, the determining factors in whether or not they'll invest the kind of capital that's required to be invested uh, in a full-service grocery store. This is one of those neighborhoods where you won't find a large grocery store. J&D grocery owner David Adams has lived his whole life in this North Omaha neighborhood. He's tried to keep healthy options in his aisles, but says spoilage caused him to throw away a lot of the product. Well, the neighborhood here, the, a lot of my customers are, are walking customers, all from the neighborhood here. It was a, a grocery store way back in the early 30s, so it, it has always been some type of grocery store here. Um, I think through the years, obviously, it, it became more of a convenience store. When I bought it, I wanted to make, I wanted to turn it back into a grocery store. So in doing that, you know, adding the meats and the produce and everything else besides just your chips and your beer, trying to keep that going throughout the years has been tough. In 2009, with a grant from the Centers for Disease Control, the Douglas County Health Department identified neighborhoods in North Omaha that had the highest combination of high-risk health factors. It then zeroed in on neighborhoods where citizens had to travel over one mile to find healthy food options. Finally, it found ways to help bring the healthy food to these neighborhoods. These grocery stores are continuing to use the distribution system that they've had. So if they're using a wholesaler, they're continuing to use that wholesaler. What we're trying to help them do is figure out what they have in their store and how to offer some different products. In most cases, they can get those products from their wholesaler. The problem has been that there's been no demand for them so that it's not fit within their business model. University of Nebraska Extension has come in to provide samples of fresh food options offered in these stores to create a demand. It's pretty okay. good. Well, you Thank you very it. much. All right. 82% of Americans located in a food desert live in urban areas, but the problem is just as severe in rural communities. Around 130 people live in the small town of Cody, Nebraska. Tucked in the northern sandhills of the state, residents here have to drive 40 miles to get to the nearest grocery store. We haven't had a grocery store for 13 years or something even more than that. Teachers at the high school saw a need for the store and an opportunity to integrate hands-on curriculum in the classroom. So the school applied and was awarded two USDA grants in 2009. One $75,000 grant will house an entrepreneurship incubator within the school and ultimately establish a grocery store. Another $95,000 grant will fund the actual building, which will be built out of straw bales to make it energy efficient. And basically the building's going to sit right here. Uh, like I said, it's 0.96 acres is what we've got leased from the Game of Parks. And, um, and it's a 99-year lease. Well, we've had people say if grocery stores couldn't work before, why would this work now? And the bottom line is we don't have to support a family. We formed a nonprofit, and funds will go into that, and then the students will decide what to do with those funds. So anything that profits above and beyond what we need to, to make the business run will be funneled back into the community via the students' decisions. These two communities are seeking solutions to combat the problem. The USDA recently introduced an online food desert locator, and Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack says the locator will help identify communities where intervention can help make healthy, affordable food more readily available. They just decided to come together as individuals and say, we're going to do something about making fresh foods available uh, in our community. 
Senator Brenda Council of North Omaha introduced a food desert bill in the Nebraska legislature last session. The measure would have authorized $150,000 each of the next two years to increase access to healthy foods in food deserts. But Nebraska Governor Dave Heineman vetoed the bill, saying he supports the goal, but the bill duplicates other federal programs. Despite having passed by a healthy margin, after the governor vetoed the bill, support dropped off and an override was unsuccessful. And that student board member is working to organize what we look at as the next generation of food system leaders within Iowa. I think when we look at the subject of food deserts, it's very quick to think it's a political problem or it's a big egg, small egg problem, and it's really not. The solution to food deserts has to include looking at the entire food system. And what we do as a food systems council is we make sure that there's a place for everyone at the table, that there's an opportunity for big ag to sit next to small organic producers, to sit next to the large distributing company, to sit next to the manager of the grocery co-op. So that by sitting next to each other, they can't point the fingers at each other for blame, but they have to work together for solutions. They have to work together for commonality. So what you think? It's good. It's good. Yeah. And it's healthy. And you can watch this story again on our FarmWeek website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also have a link to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well and read the script. That's farmweek.msucares.com. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we'll go to southwest Mississippi for a sweet feature story. It's the Magnolia Honey Company of Woodville. It's owned by three women, Shan Miller, Raven Lewis, and Gina Sessions. Magnolia has expanded from honey into many other honey-sweetened products. They even sponsor a Mississippi woman on the Pro Bass Fishing Tour. In Southern Gardening, see how to container garden in the fall. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be back next week.